ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very honored to be invited here to this marvelous conference. It's not easy to speak uh, after the talk of uh, Katie Hopkins. <laughs> My talk will not be as uh, entertaining, but I hope a, a little bit, and I will not even try. I guess you, <laughs> it's, it's not possible to top this performance. No. I guess you will uh, understand that and uh, excuse me. Um, my name is Mark Jongen. I'm a member of the AFD party of Alternative for Germany and member of the German Bundestag, the <laughs> German Parliament, and spokesman there for cultural policies. And before I was a um, lecturer of philosophy at university, and therefore my talk today, is entitled, From Free Speech to Hate Speech, a, Di a Dialectic of Enlightenment. My talk is made of 11 theses, each very short and each followed by a brief comment. I will mainly focus on the situation in Germany and Europe, but I think my considerations apply to the US as well. It's really the same stuff everywhere, as you said, Karen. First, Article 5 of the Grundgesetz, the German Constitution, is broken daily in Germany. Censorship is taking place again. The freedom of science and research is also seriously endangered. This can be demonstrated, for example, by the consequences of the so-called Network Enforcement Act, the Netzwerkdurchsetzungsgesetz, by the mainstream and state media reports on the so-called refugee crisis in 2015, or more recently, of the events in the city of Chemnitz, where the mainstream media reported on hunts uh, on migrants relying on a single video source of dubious content taken from an Antifa website while suppressing all conflicting testimony. For the future, further massive, massive restrictions on freedom of the press and freedom of speech, both on the European and German national level, are announced. I guess you are all in the US familiar with the habitual blocking of users on Facebook and other social media. Uh, <laughs> Of, as, uh, of, of people who simply think differently than the mainstream. Less well known are the restrictions on freedom of expressions that the unfortunate global compact of migration will entail. The AFD ensured that uh, this international treaty was discussed and debated in the Bundestag in, the, in the first place. Otherwise, the old parties would have passed it quietly without any discussion and Mrs. Merkel would have signed it in Marrakesh last year, which she actually did, albeit under loud and well-justified protest of the AFD. Let me quote from obligation number 33 um, for the signatory states of this uh, global compact uh, for migrations. Quote, we will enact, implement, or maintain legislation that penalizes hate crimes and aggravated hate crimes targeting migrants and train law enforcement and other public officials to identify, prevent, and respond to such crimes and other acts of violence that target migrants." End of quote. Officials should be trained to recognize these crimes in the first place. It is easy to see what kind of expressions are to, be, are to be made punishable here, namely those which at first glance cannot at all be recognized as criminal offenses. In other words, a kind of brainwashing is to be carried out first on the officials, then on the people. It is quite clear that under the surface of the melodious phrases on the battle against fake news, against hate speech and so on, there are tendencies of totalitarian control over public opinion and suppressions uh, a suppression of citizens' freedom of speech going on. To these threats of our free society, our firm resistant, resistance worldwide is necessary. Second, the politically motivated restriction for freedom of the press, media, and opinion directly attacks Article 1 of the German Constitution. Human dignity is inviolable. This dignity is rooted in the spiritual part of man, to which, philosophically speaking, freedom, both practical and transcendental, belongs indispensably. The violation of human dignity is often associated with the restriction of physical development. No one must starve or freeze, everyone needs a roof over his head, and so on. That is all well and right, 
but the spiritual part of man, which actually makes man human, namely the ability to judge freely, to form his opinion, and to express himself, is actually the core of human dignity. In this respect, we are all insulted in our human dignity if we are constrained by our governments and restricted in our freedom of speech. Let me quote from a German classical source from the lecture on dignity of man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte from 1794. After a discourse of what constitutes spiritual freedom, Fichte comes to the conclusion, quote, this is man. This is everyone who can say to himself, I am human. Shouldn't he carry a holy reverence for himself and shudder and tremble before his own majesty? That is everyone who can tell me I am, end of quote. A high, perhaps exaggerated pathos, but it marks a glorious peak of our tradition of civil, civil liberty. For the English tradition, you would perhaps cite John Stuart Mill or John Locke, maybe a little more sober, but not the less honorable. Compare that with the low point we have reached today, and you can grasp the glaring discrepancy with your hands. Three, in the late or postmodern period, there has been a new confusion, a neue Unübersichtlichkeit, how German philosopher Jürgen Habermas put it. All formerly clear political relations and antagonisms are now present in an often multiple dialectical refraction and thus present themselves in a paradoxical form. With regard to the issue of freedom of speech, this means that its restriction, once practiced by dark reactionary powers, is today demanded in the name of enlightenment, in the name of the free, tolerant, and cosmopolitan society. This means that the ideas and concepts which in the dawn of enlightenment led to the emancipation of man from spiritual and political bondage to a society of free citizens are now in danger of being abused to establish a new regime of mental slavery and suppression. The example of tolerance, an almost sacred value of German mainstream politics nowadays, illustrates this very well. This originally positive attitude of tolerance, which we have fought for in the Western world and, and of which we can be proud, has been internalized by all the participants of these struggles, often with a great toll of uh, blood in a long historical process. If, however, we now confront with that attitude of tolerance a religion or culture as Islam that didn't go through the Enlightenment in similar struggles, then serious problems arise. There is every reason to be, to be concerned that as soon as the majority of the population or even a sufficient number became Muslims, Islam will not practice that tolerance anymore that, is, that its functionaries now so angel-like talk about. Let's not forget that none of the 42 Islamic countries worldwide is what we would call a democracy. In his book from the 1940s, The Open Societies and, Society and Its Enemies, the arch-liberal philosopher Karl Popper pleads for an open, tolerant society, but also names a clear limit of tolerance. One must practice intolerance against the, intolerance them, the intolerant themselves, he states. Otherwise, they will destroy the tolerant and open society in the end. We, the AFD and all those who are politically close to us, like you all here, I suppose, have been warning for years against such developments as Sharia police on the streets of German cities, honor killings within the Muslim community, strong inclinement of the Muslim youth towards militant Islam, Islamism, and so on. The bad hairs of the Enlightenment, the leftists, attack us for that, denounce us as the enemies of the open society, and thus pervert completely the idea of tolerance. Tolerance means respect for the individual, not idolatry for cultures that trample on individual and civil rights. Four. In their classical book from the 1940s, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer outlined the basic idea of such a dialectic of enlightenment, that the historical tendency towards emancipation from humiliating and oppressive circumstances ultimately lead to a world that radiates in the sign of triumphal calamity, as they put it. 
The fact that they are hairs of the, the hairs of the critical th theory today themselves contribute to repeating or somehow reenacting a dialectic of enlightenment within the tradition of critical theory itself in such a way that they contradict the ideals and goals of enlightenment can be regarded as an ironic confirmation of Adorno and Horkheimer's thesis. The book was written during the Second World War uh, that might explain to some point how this gloomy view came about. By the way, it was written just a few miles or a 10 minutes drive away from here, from this building in Paci uh, Pacific Palisades, both Horkheimer's and Adorno's American exile during the war. Today's leftists ironically ensure that exactly what Adorno and Horkheimer have described occurs, that it, that it became a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The leftist war of using reasons, the leftist way of using reason leads to a world in which one can no longer express oneself freely, in which, for example, the party members of AFD must be afraid that their cars will be set on fire or that they get seriously injured, as it happened to a colleague of mine, member of parliament, who got hit on his head by so-called left activists and nearly got a skull fracture not to speak of all those who lose their jobs or businesses because of their support for our party. This is an ironic, a bitter ironic enlightenment dialectic of second order, as it were, brought about by the left itself. That's my point today for the philosophically interested. Fifth, on the basis of the path uh, from free speech to hate speech, the dialectic of enlightenment of the newer type can be well illustrated. Whereas in the past, the right to public expressions was generously granted also to explicitly wrong and offensive positions, today the evil eye of suspicion is cast on more and more opinions, politically incorrect expressions, and more and more are more and more criminalized and pathologized as hate crimes. From the point of view of language philosophy, the concept of hate speech is based on the problematic assumption that there are speech acts that are, that are at, this, at once real actions. In other words, there are expressions which in themselves constitute a crime, a so-called hate crime. So it is assumed that these uh, words hurt so much that they amount to the severity of a bodily injury. But this makes the sensibility and sensitivity of those who feel hurt by these words the measure of what is still allowed and what should be forbidden. In the US, you have the phenomenon of the so-called snowflake students <laughs> who feel so hurt by the slightest suggestions of a disparagement, uh, for example, of their ethnic group or gender, that they have to flee to so-called safe spaces on university campuses uh, where they can uh, then recover. In Europe, uh, we are not quite there but yet, but we are on the way there. And it's important to put a stop on this because this type of children's room in universities is a serious attack on scientific freedom. Yeah. And therefore, sixth, freedom is always the freedom of the dissident, as Rosa Luxemburg, a famous socialist activist in pre-war Germany, put it. However, this must not only apply within socialism, as intended by Rosa Luxemburg, but universally. Since the dissident in particular is suspected of being driven by hatred, a criminal offense of hate speech opens the door to a poisonous hermeneutics of suspicion and gives governments the opportunity to fight unpleasant political opponents through criminalization and suspend democratic controversy. To deepen this, one would have to open a book by the Russian philosopher Boris Groys, Under Suspicion, a Phenomenology of the Media. There, one could learn that the media are in itself structured in such a way that they extremely promote su such insinuations, projections, and uh, moods of suspicion. On the medial surface, the Nazi or fascist phantom can thrive wonderfully. There are probably few, very few real Nazis left in Germany at the moment. Nevertheless, the Nazi phantom is haunting the media and suggests, suggests omnipresence. So an inflationary Nazi propagation can take place and the AFD can be subjected to this witch hunt which we experience every day. They say that uh, the AFD, AFD steer up hatred 
which of course is never proven. If, on the other hand, Antifa and its left-wing friends loudly chant the slogan, all of Berlin hates the AFD on the streets of Berlin and elsewhere, this is not considered a hate speech. Nice contradiction. Seven, the concept of hate speech has a justifiable core. This is already sufficiently taken into account in the German criminal law by paragraphs uh, 185 to 188. Uh, that um, ban uh, slander, defamation, and so on. Beyond that, it is not possible to define a cr criminal offense or censorship reason hate speech in such a way that it would not be at least grossly susceptible to abuse and the reasons against it therefore would not clearly predominate. This can be um, illustrated by the examples for hate speech given by the German Federal Agency for Political Education. On an information sheet, which you can also find on the internet, they give the following examples for hate speech. Conscious dissemination of uninformed or false statements, such as, refugees all have expensive mobile, mobile phones, or refugees do not have to pay in the supermarket. You see, these are not gross, gross insults, but rather generalizing observation of facts Many so-called refugees are actually traveling with mobile phones, hence the mass distribution all over the world of the Merkel selfies as invitation signals to Germany. There are not a few cases in which refugees have not paid in the supermarket because the shop assistants were instructed to simply tolerate theft out of a misunderstood idea of tolerance. To make this public is now considered a hate speech. Generalization is forbidden, there are just individual cases, Einzelfälle, no matter how frequently they occur. This problem is even more serious when we speak uh, of rapes, which are now happening very frequently in Germany, and which the mainstream media do not report on, and if, then tr tribalize them. Eight, a main argument against the concept of hate speech is the difficulty to distinguish clearly enough the emotion of hate from that of anger which can be a just anger if it refers to actual grievances. Who wants to prohibit the just anger educates people to political lethargy and to meek toleration of despotism and oppression of any kind. This too is an attack on human dignity and a guide to political immaturity. In this context, the ancient Greek doctrine of the soul is to be mentioned, especially the thymos, which is one of the three soul areas besides the logos and the eros, as described classically by Plato. While the logos is the rational part and eros is the desiring part of man, the thymotic part encompasses everything that has to do with pride, with honor, with, uh, with, honor, with sense of justice, with anger, as well as the more evil uh, emotions in this direction like resentment or hate. Psychopolitically speaking, this thymotic sphere is the realm of uh, realm of politics of politics where the struggles of power and of recognition are taking place. Um, I have to shorten because I think it's two minutes left. So I um, want to say that this uh, de this uh, obli oblivion of Thymus in which we're living in makes me always think of Monty Python's film, The Life of Brian, <laughs> uh, which you all know, of course, and in one scene, Brian, who is uh, considered as the Messiah, to his great annoyance, uh, tries to explain to his uncalled followers that it is not necessary to follow a Messiah and tries to encourage them to think for themselves. Standing on that balcony, he says, you are all individuals, you are all different, you are all got to work it out for yourselves. And below the mass answers, like out of one mouth, yes, we are all individuals. We are all got to work out for ourselves. And in the same way, politics and mainstream media try to systematically educate us to such a dumb mess, repeating the slogans of the Enlightenment like phrases and thus mocking their meaning. Nine, coming slowly to the end, Judith Butler, the high priestess of genderism, presented uh, further arguments against the criminalization and, or, of, or censorship of hate speech in her book, Excitable Speech of 1997. 
When she was awarded the Adorno Prize in Germany in 2011 and accused of anti-Semitism on this occasion, whether justified or not, I, won't, I don't want to judge here, she defended herself with arguments that are also valid in today's debate about alleged hate crimes. And I, say, uh, I quote Butler, what is needed is a public space in which such issues might be thoughtfully debated and to prevent that space being defined by certain kinds of exclusion and censorship. The world of public discourse would, would then to be one from which critical perspectives would be excluded and the public would come to understand itself as one that does not speak out in the face of obvious and illegitimate violence." End of quote. In my, in my lecture at the Hannah Arendt Center in New York uh, two years ago, I said, among other things, that the Jews in France today leave the country in large numbers not because of the populists, but because they are increasingly being attacked by Muslim anti-Semites. Further, that illegal mass immigration in Germany has led to a significant increase uh, in the crime rate. That is what Mrs. Butler and friends are now calling Islamophobia and racism and why they criticized my invitation uh, at the Hannah Arendt Center in an open letter sharply and described it as a mistake. And this shows very clearly, I come to the end, it is extremely difficult for the left liberal political and academic world to remain true to its own best insights regarding freedom of expression in the face of actually other opinions. Their habitual application of double standards, depending on whether the good or the bad speak, shows that a concept like hate speech is part of an overarching political agenda that is not about enforcing human, uh, universal <coughs> human rights, but about the interests and power politics of well-defined groups. And that is why events like today's, the entire work of the American Freedom Alliance is so important. This is exactly what happens here, keeping the discourse space open in times of narrowing scope. Thank you very much. <laughs>